Hello and welcome to uh, At Chat State. Today we're talking about media and culture with students from the COM 1010 class, our survey of mass communications. Everybody say hello. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about um, how do media practitioners like TV executives and movie producers and just social media people, how do they use psychology to influence us and affect us? Um, First of all, like, what do y'all think of like movie previews? Do you enjoy watching previews at the movies? Pass, pass in the mic, please. Um, well, for me personally, <clears throat> um, going to the movies, part of seeing some of the trailers, I think, are the most exciting parts because it really, even just a small one, it kind of builds up suspense of, oh, that movie could be kind of anything, and like we've mentioned earlier the movie theater is kind of a sacred place for human bonding so i think that really does a good job of kind of drawing us in all right well you talked about two things there but first of all the the previews it seems like those are um just planting a seed like getting you thinking about something almost a year in advance have, have you ever like waited and waited for a movie and then like uh, wasn't that good yeah, I think that the anticipation plays a big part in it. I think, you know, they take cuts of the best parts and then kind of kind of cut the scene and leave you hanging like, oh, what's going to happen there? And then, you know, through this trailer. So and like you say, repeated repetition, you see this commercial, see this commercial. So when the movie comes out with the anticipation, you're like, oh, I got to go see it. But a lot of times when you get to the theater, then it's all slow and the action isn't quite. Did anybody see a Jason Statham movie called, uh, where he was driving people, what was that called? Driver? Transporter. So uh, there were scenes in that trailer for that film that weren't in the film. They like got cut out. There's like a scene oh, where wow. he deflects a missile with a red pan or something. So that's deception. That's, that's really deceiving that, yeah, you know, I wanted to see that missile hit him or whatever. So I think that's an interesting thing. All right, you talked about movies being a sacred place. Um, how, like, for a lot of people, it almost seems like media has become a bigger part of their lives than, than maybe it should, or maybe we even realize. But, like, how big, we've got our government, we've got schools, we've got, um, you know, working, but our media is, our, what we consume is a big factor. How do you think that plays into our lives? I think that the consumption of media is inevitable, like, because it's really just become this kind of background white noise. Even if we don't notice it, it's there. And the fact that it's so large and inescapable, it's more than likely retained somewhere subconsciously. I mean, but that's only my guess. Well, that's cool. Um, and then kind of like how, how they try to get to our subconscious, talked about movie previews. How about like when people release an album and you can download it online it gets leaked and i know jordan in our class he reviews albums on a site called nappyafro.com that everybody should go check out um he was who was the artist that you had had we'll yell at you off camera the last review you did rick ross rick ross yes. all right so his his stuff was available online before it was for sale all right so what does that do to the album sales like do you think that's counterproductive I think that it would be counterproductive because it's an invasion of his, uh, you know, his uh, his career, you know, because his his sales is based on, you know, the record sales, and if you have it without even purchasing it, you know, that's an invasion of his, uh, you know, money that he could be making in the future. So people are ripping him off, but it's interesting though that it doesn't seem to. A lot of those things don't seem to take away from from the earnings. Like if something gets leaked, people still seem to, enough people seem to go back and buy it when it does come out. So it's almost like those negative things seem bad, but they're almost a bigger payoff. And then there's a controversy about it, which is interesting too. Well, that would take me back to what you were saying about the psychology of the media and whatnot. Like I, I do believe that a lot of artists <clears throat> do lose when albums are leaked. But then on another note, how much of their promotional funding is used to create this leak? Mm -hmm. So if I put it out there purposely and call it a leak, you know, I'm losing money or we so we think, but that's kind of might be part of the 
smart businessmen that might be part of their their scheme. So now they, people, oh, I got the new Rick Ross, and ain't nobody heard it, and, and so it gets passed around and, and talked about a little bit. So when the album does drop, that's that same anticipation as the movie trailer we were talking about. So it, it builds up the hype. Right. right. Well, speaking of hyping things, um, Nick Cannon, Shariki, you were talking about this earlier. He's got something going on that's causing some controversy. What is it? Um, well, he recently, he's doing some type of documentary where he does what they call whiteface, um, where he pretty much dresses up as a white character. And of course, Nick Cannon is a comedian, so he's coming off as a comedic aspect versus a racial aspect of it. However, um, the media has been portraying it as if it's a really, really racial thing. You know, lots of things have been said about it versus the many things that should have been said the same with blackface. Well, does anybody remember uh, when Whoopi Goldberg was dating uh, the dude from Cheers? Cheers. Yeah. 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 Ted Danson, Ted, Ted Danson. Ted. So he showed up at the Oscars in blackface with Whoopi on his arm and people freaked out. <laughs> but it seems like when people do whiteface, which isn't that common, like white chicks, I guess. Right. But uh, when people do that, nobody's like upset racially. Yeah. Um, but yet they're still talking about this. Yes. Almost as if people are trying to claim reverse discrimination. Right, exactly. When I doubt anyone actually cares. <laughs> the only thing that was bad about white chicks was the acting. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's just a terrible movie yeah, across the, the board. Yeah, he had everything about the film. But other than, but not the white face. That was the only thing that was not wrong with that film. That's good. Tracy, what were you gonna say? Okay, um, well that's like, I have this idea that in this day and age, we don't really talk about race a lot. I feel like comedians are some of the only people actually bringing up the topics. Um, do you feel like in this day and age, people feel comfortable talking about race? And I think Tracy may you have said in class or maybe online, I've seen this, um, sometimes bringing it up too much is, is a negative. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's gonna keep a whole nation of people racially divided because we are all Americans. That's something we have in common and we did we tend to, you know, separate ourselves from that one fact. We all share a country, and you know, our race and all of that stuff is irrelevant because we all are dependent on the same government. What we have to ask ourselves is why is this government allowing us to see so much division? Is it deliberate? You know, is it deliberately designed to keep the whole nation divided? You know, so, you know, sometimes I think that it's a strategy to keep so many people divided and they are all a group of united people. They all agree and we all disagree. That's why they're successful. That's why they're successful as a government. And it's interesting, I, I'm not sure if you're implying this, but you've, you talk about them and the kind, of, kind of like having media. a majority. Um, I was wondering, are you meaning, uh, are you thinking at all about our country being led typically by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men like but the government is not just white yeah. the government is a conglomeration of cooperation of all different races mm -hmm. because when you work for the government you deny your race it tells you on applications you can't mm -hmm. focus on race creed ethnicity so it's not about you know it's not about race it's about a government a government is comprised of a history mm -hmm. and that history is the legacy of this nation you know and it's gonna be interesting too to see you know as a uh, as our populations are changing and we're having larger minority populations, which will not long, no longer be minorities if the African-American Hispanic populations surpass uh, Caucasian. Um, does that matter though? Like, is it, is it gonna, are, are, what's gonna change in the next 20 years? Honestly, I don't seeing it change much. Uh, we hear people talk about the great immigration debate and whatnot. But I don't see how it's any different from the mass immigrations of the Poles and the Jews and the Italians back in the 20s and 30s. People had that argument of they're taking the jobs and they're corrupting the language and they're corrupting the culture. But now, today, if we look back, uh, it's an inherent part of our culture. I believe it's one in four Americans claim German heritage. Uh, like one in eight claims Italian. Uh, when we look at comedy, there's Mel Brooks and Mel Blanc and a bunch of those people. So I'm, if the minority populations do continue to grow, uh, 
I don't see how it will be much different than it is today, like looking back anyway. Mm. Well, it is really interesting thinking about how does the media spin this topic? Um, it seems like it, it comes up uh, in cable 24 seven news networks, but it's usually like we were talking about, like the Nick Cannon thing. It's a, it's a blown up controversy. That's not really a controversy. It's just filling airtime. Uh, as a comedian, how do you think? Because I really do believe comedians are the most honest people mm -hmm. in our media uh, when it comes to some of these things, although they certainly play up stereotypes. Uh, as a comedian, Larry, what, what's your, for kerosene comedy, for anybody who wants to go check that out? As a comedian, it's all a joke to me. Uh, no, but really, it kind of is. You know, racial differences and cultures and all, I, I believe that they, it's all a beautiful thing where you come from and to share and mix and match and mingle. I think it's a great thing. And just like he was saying, you know, when you, when you get into the military, why is it that when you get into the military, it's on there, okay, lose all the racial conflicts, we don't do that here. But when you apply for a regular job through your know, regular citizens, that's not on it. I even ask you what your, you know, it, it perpetuates. The, the separation and the difference, you know, what's your nationality, you know, why is that even on the application? And then why is that that dis disclosure not on the application? Okay, here in this, this establishment, we do not, you know, even acknowledge mm -hmm. race. So that would eliminate that whole question of your ethnicity, you know. So I, I just think that through the media and other, I think it's perpetuated. Even if you just walked in a room and said, you know, that was a racial issue. It, it's a negative cloud right there. Yeah. All you said is a racial issue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's automatic negative. It, you know, there's, you know, why can't you walk in a room and say, well, that was a racial issue. And people start to think of positive things that it could have been discussed. Mm -hmm. people, don't, people don't go there. It's, it had to be a negative conversation, you know. Well, that's, uh, anybody have anything else on this topic? Oh, I was just going to say, man, when you look at the small community of people that oversee our government, it's just a small community of people. If they gave us a wisdom and an intelligence and a mind greater than that small community of people that oversee us, then we would be wiser than our government. So when we expect them to give us this mind that is able to oversee their minds, you're not going to get that. America keeps you divided on purpose. It calls this north, this south, this east, this west, this gay, this straight, this male, this, it, it divides you to the, all the way down to the economy. So that when I look at you, I never see an American. I see your financial status. I see your race. I see your gender. I see your sexual preference. We are all have one thing in common. We're Americans, and we suffer because of America. You know what I'm saying? And we're being I, denied. And I we're just have being, to ask this. What church do you preach at? I don't I gotta, I gotta go to this church, man. I don't Every time you talk, I'm like, but I mean, you have such a strong voice. I, I, give you I don't want to diminish what you're saying, okay. though. Um, that is a whole huge can of worms, though. I'm going to let David have one last comment, and then we'll wrap uh, up. Yeah, I, I do love it when you speak. Yes. Like, yeah. you're just one of those people you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. But I agree with the, uh, the constant divisions of... I mean, it's really seen every day. And the question is whether we actually do it purposefully or subconsciously, because humans being social creatures will try to gravitate towards one another, but they want to do it with a sense of familiarity. I do agree that the government is doing it, and if they can target out the financial status, uh, it's better for advertisers and media, and then they can gain more money and thus more power, which as you know, makes them happy. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, it's really a, a, an interesting topic and it's really hard to even get into it because most people don't think about it. They don't think about how the government or the media or anybody's subconsciously trying to affect us so and all, trying to get our money. It's all called visual effects. That's visually affecting me. Mm -hmm. I can look at TV and get hungry. I can look at TV and make a vote. I can look at TV and start crying. These people are not inside of my house, but what they're showing me is affecting me mentally, psychologically. It's, it's creating behavior and responses. Mm -hmm. This is psychology. Mm -hmm. What goes through my eyes will affect my mind, and it, and, it, and it determines behavior. If I watch a Hardest commercial, they don't want me to go to Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. They want me to go to Hardest. If they show, whatever they show me is what they want me to duplicate 
or at least consider believing, you know. Right. Well, what's interesting too is uh, when it's food, we don't kind of mind admitting it. But if it's a vote or something else, yeah. we're kind of like, oh, that doesn't affect me. But like you say, if I see a Hardee's, uh, one of those gross thick burgers, <laughs> yeah. then that's all I'm thinking about for us today. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up. Really, I, you guys get it. You guys understand how the media and everything's working together to influence us. Um, Thank you guys for watching, and when we come back, we'll be uh, talking about sports. Bye-bye.